Welcome to this breakout session on Creo Parametric Implementation and Administration for 2020 and beyond. This is a very nuts and bolts discussion about how to maximize your team's success with Creo Parametric. This talk is intended for two main groups of people and product development organizations. Those who are planning a new implementation of Creo Parametric and those who have already implemented Creo Parametric but want to improve their efficiency and processes. And a disclaimer, product data management, or PDM, is a huge part of any CAD implementation. However, discussion of Windchill or any other PDM systems or methods is beyond the scope of this talk. Just to give you a little background about me, for 13 years I was a pro engineer, Creo Parametric, and Windchill instructor and consultant. Since then, I have over seven years of experience as a Creo Parametric and Windchill administrator in the Jeff Bezos world at Amazon Lab 126, Amazon Prime Air, and Blue Origin. The lessons I'm going to share in this talk are the result of those experiences. Here is my core point. A successful implementation and ongoing administration depends on three main factors, people, process, and technology. Your learning system arches over all three. And of the three, people, process, and technology, the most critical one is people. What's the risk of an unsuccessful implementation? This will have adverse effects on your internal and external customers. Your internal customers are your end users, the people who drive Creo Parametric on a daily basis. It's critical to keep these people happy. Your external customers are outside of your product development team. This may include other teams within your company, like manufacturing, supply chain, and planning, and of course, the people outside your company who purchase and use your products. What are the results of a failed implementation? Schedule delays, cost overruns, loss of sales, your end users will be frustrated and unhappy, and potentially displacement of the CAD tool for an alternative. Displacements are always messy and expensive. Here's the agenda for this discussion. First, I'll discuss different aspects of the technology necessary for implementation. Next, I'll talk about the processes you will need to define. Third, the most important aspect, people. Fourth, I'll discuss the learning system you should implement that crosses over people, process, and technology. And finally, I'll cover the three takeaways from this talk. Let's jump into technology. First, you are going to purchase licenses of Creo Parametric for your team, and your team members need to be able to access them. For this, you are going to need a license server. The only requirements for a license server are that it has to be reliable, and your team members need to be able to access it, both internally and on VPN. To avoid problems like this, you might want to deploy your license server on the cloud. Based on your needs, you may want to have a custom script for launching Creo Parametric. Some of the tasks that a startup script can do include specify available license configurations, kill any lingering Creo processes that might interfere with launching a new Creo session successfully, copying or updating your company's config.profile, more on that later, and Delete any unnecessary files that were generated during previous Creo sessions, like import log files, error files, trail files, and so on. You're going to need a standard parts library. When you don't have one, team members create their own sets of fasteners and other common components. It becomes a nightmare for file naming, data reuse, and BOM management. A standard parts library prevents people from reinventing the wheel and helps maintain company standards. Besides a standard parts library, you're going to need a materials library. This library should contain all the materials that are commonly used by your teams and should also contain material properties for performing structural, thermal, and modal analyses. You can either develop the materials library yourself or you could license one from suppliers like Granta. If you are using other tools like Creo Schematics, depending on the number of users, you may need a central catalog and a librarian to manage that central catalog. 
Later on, I'll discuss a ticket system. Users should be able to request library components and materials. As your team grows, you will probably want a dedicated librarian to fulfill these requests. The biggest problem I've seen companies have hiring a librarian is that the job requisitions are for unicorns. They want someone with a master's degree, who's an expert at Creo and Windchill, who knows how to code, who has a deep understanding of ANSI drawing standards, and on and on. A librarian doesn't need all those skills. And anyone who has all those skills wouldn't want to be a librarian. There are a number of configuration files in Creo Parametric that control the way the software looks and behaves. These include, but aren't limited to, your config.pro and config.sub files, user interface customization files, model tree configuration files for Creo 5.0 and earlier, appearance files for colors, system colors files, and drawing detail files. I'm going to discuss config.pro and config.sub only. You can think of the .sub file as the super file or supervisor file. The .sub file contains settings that you want to impose on your users. These include things like default templates, folder locations for company resources, and required product data management settings. The config.sub file should contain as few options as possible. You don't want to frustrate your end users by preventing them from working the way that they want to work. You can have a company level config.profile and these are more like recommendations. Users will be able to override the company level config.profile with their own personal config.profiles. You're going to need to set up start parts, start assemblies, drawing formats, and drawing templates. PTC provides some in the Creo Parametric load point, but you're going to want to set up your own. Here are some things that you want to establish in your start parts and start assemblies. System of units. Especially for companies based in the United States, deciding between English units and the metric system is a bigger decision than you realize. Default datums, including planes, coordinate systems, and possibly even axes. This includes what you would want to name these datums. A layering scheme that works for your team. Generally, I find the layer schemes in PTC's default templates to be a little too confusing especially for less experienced users. And default parameters and relations. You may need different templates for different functional areas. For example, routed systems like cabling and piping will most likely need different templates than for structural and mechanical models. When I was at Amazon Prime Air, we also needed a set of templates in a vehicle coordinate system where the default datums were station, butt line, and water line. Another important consideration for your model templates is supporting model-based definition, or MBD. If so, your templates may also include additional annotation planes, annotation features, and combination states. If you're unsure where to start with setting up MBD in your templates, I recommend checking out PTC's training class on MBD in Precision LMS, as well as MIL Standard 31000. On the drawing side, you're going to want to create your own formats and templates. A format contains graphics for the sheet border and zones, and usually a few tables like a title block and a revision block. Templates contain a format and help automate drawing creation by placing views, notes, dimensions, tables, and other details on your drawing. You will typically have different formats and templates for the different sheet sizes that you support, like A, B, C, D, and so on. You'll very likely have different templates for piece parts, assemblies, source control drawings, and so on. Be sure to minimize the number of templates where possible because there will be times when you need to update them and it can involve quite a bit of effort. To recap, in the area of technology, some of the things you will need to deploy include your license server, startup scripts, standard parts and materials libraries, configuration files, and model and drawing templates. Now let's switch to the area of processes. First, onboarding. How do you bring new people onto the project? Your onboarding process for new employees affects how long it takes them to become productive. Here are some of the things that should be considered in your process. 
How do they get their necessary hardware? How do you make sure that they have access to the files they need? How do they figure out where the models are? What are the part numbers for the top level assemblies? How do you train them in the team's design standards and processes? And how do you assess their skill level? Speaking of design standards, you're going to need them. Design standards ensure that people create models and drawings in accordance with your company's standards. They also increase uniformity to avoid models and drawings having their own unique styles. You don't want your company's deliverables to look like 20 different people created your drawings, even if they did. These standards include your part number and naming scheme, your modeling practices. These include how you manage bottom-up and top-down design, and it also includes your guidelines for sheet metal, cable harness design, piping, ECAD, mechanisms, and more. The parameters and attributes that support data management and data reuse, your drawing checking, and release processes. Be prepared to get these wrong. It may take several attempts to figure out what works for you. If you have to start over, it's better done sooner rather than later. Along with your design process, you have to establish standards for what your deliverables are. You will likely have to deliver more than drawings. If you are doing drawings, are PDFs going to be your file of record? Or are you going to be a model-based enterprise? Are you going to use both drawings and model-based definition? Some of the other considerations for your deliverables include what file formats will you provide to external customers, native Creo files, step files, or CreoView PVZ files? Bills of material, are these going to reside on your drawings or is your PDM system the source of truth? And how are you going to manage first article inspection information? Your team members are going to launch new products and new parts. Over time, you will need to develop a process for this. New product introduction at a practical level includes How do you launch a new top-level assembly? Who builds the initial structure? How do you generate, assign, or reserve part numbers? How are you going to develop and manage the overall shape? In aerospace, this is often referred to as the outer mold line, or OML. In consumer products, it is the industrial design, or ID. And how are you going to manage space claims? How do you manage interfaces between the major systems of your product, like structural, mechanical, electrical, user interfaces, and so on? And how do you communicate this information amongst the team? Every single CAD model and drawing has to have an owner. This person is responsible for ensuring that the model geometry is correct. Usually, this is pretty easy to manage at the individual part and subassembly level. The person who creates, inherits, or releases the drawing is often the person responsible for that part or assembly. This often breaks down when you get to the higher levels and top levels of the product. Who is responsible for ensuring that the CAD is clean and not broken? It's imperative that someone is assigned in that role and you don't have people pointing fingers at each other. The CAD owner is responsible for proper regeneration, reasonable retrieval time, clean modeling, and that changes made at that level don't impact negatively the next higher level. Creo Parametric has tools like Model Check and XMA, the expert model analysis tool, for checking the quality of your CAD models. Unfortunately, there are things that software can't check. You need to get human eyeballs on your models on a regular basis. At least once a month, you need to retrieve the top-level assemblies and major installations and perform an audit. When I was at Amazon, I developed a spreadsheet that listed all the different things a person should check for to ensure that you have clean green models. These include checks like retrieval and regeneration, are company modeling practices being followed, are there bad practices like circular references, insert mode, and suppressed objects? Are tools like simplified reps and 3D annotations being used to help the model? Is visibility being properly managed via layers, combination states, and other tools? And how user-friendly are the models? Are features, datums, and cross-sections renamed? Who should be performing these audits? The CAD owners, of course. To recap, some of the things you have to address in the areas of process include onboarding, design standards and processes, deliverables, 
new product and new part introduction, and CAD ownership and audits. Now, let's talk about the most important area that will make or break your implementation, people. The people portion of your implementation is all about confidence and trust. You want your end users to know that you are going to provide them with the tools and skills necessary to do their jobs, that you're going to support them, and that Creo Parametric is the best choice for your team. You want your users to feel that they are part of a community and that you are addressing their changing needs as end users of Creo Parametric. How do you do that? First step, user groups and user meetings. First, you should have a mailing list that allows you to get in contact with your user base quickly. Don't spam it. Use it too often and your users will stop paying attention. I recommend that you host meetings of your end users once a month. Of course, this gets more complicated if you are multi-site and multi-time zone. It can be hard to get people to show up to meetings. They're trying to meet schedule and deadlines. How do you get them to show up? Quite honestly, you bribe them. There are two ways to do this. Food. Engineers and designers will always show up for free food. You can pick up a few boxes of pizza or party trays from Subway, Chipotle, Jimmy John's, El Pollo Loco, and so on. You should be able to feed people for about $5 per person. And raffles. I used to give away a $25 Amazon gift card at our user meetings. Attendance skyrocketed. What's the structure of a user meeting? First, news. When is the next release coming out? When are you planning to update to the next build code? What new modules or licenses are you looking at purchasing? What changes are you making to templates, configuration files, or other aspects of your infrastructure? Keeping your user base informed of what you're doing and why is a great way to build trust. The main part of the meeting should be a learning takeaway with a demo, and this needs to be something that provides value to their daily life. Once a quarter, I would run a tips and tricks session, and that would be the most popular. And finally, open forum. This is the opportunity for the user base to provide feedback and ask questions. Walkabouts. When I can, I like to spend an hour a day just touching base with end users, just saying hi and asking if they need any help today. The more often you do it, the more your end users will appreciate that you care about them and want to solve their problems. There's enormous value in simply sitting where your end users work. If there are times when you can, just grab your laptop and sit with your internal customers. Now I want to talk about something that affects how you earn trust and build confidence. Do you believe that you can change someone's mind with facts, evidence, or logical reasoning? The more you try to convince someone who disagrees with you, the more entrenched they become in their original position. This is confirmation bias. How do you overcome this? As part of understanding the dynamics of your team members, I highly recommend reading The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. He talks about three special kinds of agents of change. Mavens. These people hold big information and ideas. They know everything about everything. People go to them when they want to learn stuff. These are your Creo experts. Connectors. These people know people. They know everyone and everyone tends to like them. And salesmen. These people foster change through persuasion. They are charismatic storytellers. The best way to get your end users to believe in and adopt the various aspects of your implementation is by having people they trust support your ideas. Once you've identified these connectors, mavens, and salespeople, you want to invite them to be members of a special council. I've always called them the Legion of Super Users. Here are some of the things that you want to cover in meetings with them. Updates and heads up. Let them know what changes you are planning to make to your infrastructure and get their opinion and buy-in. Feedback. What's happening on the product teams when you're not around? The Festivus airing of grievances. What's causing them pain and how have you disappointed them? Make sure they communicate information from these meetings to their teams. They are your ambassadors to the end users. They really are your superheroes. You're going to need a system that people can use to file support tickets. As mentioned earlier, this ticket system can be used to put in requests for new materials and library parts or to have models moved into the library. But more importantly, 
This ticket system will be used to request help. Typical areas include installing software or fixing a broken installation, fixing broken models and getting drawing details to look right, finding out how to implement something they've never done before, and changes to your start parts, start assemblies, formats, config options, and so on. Here are some qualities that your system should support. Triage, being able to assess a ticket quickly. Prioritization, some means of ranking or classifying tickets from enterprise down to whenever you can give me a hand. And resolution tracking, was the problem solved? If so, how? And can your end users access resolve tickets to solve problems on their own? You want to be able to generate metrics from the tickets so that you can perform analytics on the data. Metrics are important because they allow you to identify the most common sources of your problems. Then you can fix those problems. Also, they provide you data that you can present to management to justify more people and resources for your support team. I am not a fan of allowing end users to drop in at the desks of those providing support. This is also known as a walk-up model. Desk drop-ins and walk-ups have the following disadvantages. It gives unfair priority to those in proximity. It prevents you from addressing the cases that have a higher level of urgency. According to the University of Irvine, after a distraction, it can take you 23 minutes to refocus. And unless you're creating tickets after the fact, you don't have any metrics for this support. Regular walkabouts can help eliminate these. These are not the only things that you need for the people part of your implementation. Keep exploring for new avenues to build trust and confidence. Some other potential support systems include social chat systems like Slack, HipChat, and Microsoft Teams, and office hours. Virtual office hours could be a powerful means of support, especially for users located at other sites or in other time zones. To recap, some of the things in the people portion of your implementation include user groups and user meetings, walkabouts and hoteling to interact with your end users on a regular basis, a legion of super users, and a support ticket system. Now we turn to the final area that ties people, process, and technology together, learning. You want to establish a learning program, not a training program. There's a difference. Training implies an event. Learning is an ongoing process. All learning and training are forms of sales. Because people don't realize this, they end up doing it wrong. If you want to learn how to deliver better demonstrations and training, I highly recommend reading Great Demo. Learning is really selling the student on functionality and processes. When setting up your learning program, it's important to understand that there are both different thinking styles as well as learning styles. The four different thinking styles are conceptual. How does this all fit together? Creative. What kinds of problems can I solve with this? Practical. How do I use this? And Reflective. How does this relate to my past experiences? The four different learning styles for adult learners are auditory, they need to hear the material, environmental, physical comfort is extremely important, kinesthetic, the learner has to be hands-on, and visual, I have to see it. Given the variety of thinking styles and learning styles, you can't deliver training material in one format and expect it to work for everyone. To be effective, you have to deliver training in a variety of formats. These include your traditional instructor-led training, web-based training, documents, job aids such as checklists, procedures, workflows, and quick reference cards, and videos that are easily searchable. Your learning program needs a certification program, but this should be different than the one you use to hire people. My recommendation for implementing internal certification involves two parts. Part one is a self-assessment. 
end users go through a list of topics and assess their current skill level in a particular area. They also assess whether they need those skills in their current role. On the design side, a structural engineer doesn't have to have the same skills as someone who designs sheet metal components or does cabling and piping. And not all cabling people need to do schematics and harness flattening. And designers have significantly different skill needs than analysts or manufacturing engineers. So if this is a self-assessment, you might be asking, why wouldn't a person just lie? Why wouldn't they just say that they're proficient in all areas? First, I sincerely hope that we've hired people with integrity. Second, it's important to convey to end users that it's in their best interest to answer truthfully and honestly. Certification isn't about getting the gold star on your forehead. It's about identifying gaps in the end user's ability to use the tools of their job and then filling those gaps. The second part about certification should be based around skills, actually driving the software and generating deliverables. The great thing is you already have the means to assess whether someone is proficient in the tools of their trade. Our end users drive Creo Parametric in their jobs. If they're on the design side, they are most likely creating parts, assemblies, and drawings. If they are analysts, they are performing simulations and generating reports. If they're in manufacturing, they are designing tooling, generating CNC toolpaths, and creating process plans. Let their deliverables prove they know how to use the software. Let them present their outputs to their managers and the CAD team as proof of their skills and ability. This isn't about passing or failing. This isn't about a badge or certificate. It's about identifying the end user's strengths and weaknesses and then developing a learning plan to bridge the skills gap. Just like your CAD implementation, certification is a process, not an event. And it's an ongoing activity because the state of an individual certification changes with their roles, program needs, time, and career advancement. To recap, Learning ties together the people, process, and technology aspects of your implementation. All training is sales. Adults have different thinking and learning styles. Therefore, you have to deliver your learning using a variety of methods. Your learning program should incorporate certification as a means of assessing skills gaps and then developing individualized learning programs to address those gaps. There you have it, people, process, technology, and learning. Before closing, let me recap the top three takeaways from this session. First, implementations and administration are not events, but ongoing processes that continually evolve. Learning is an overarching activity for how you manage your implementations, people, processes, and technology. And the most important part of your implementation, the deciding factor that will make or break you, is how you develop trust and confidence with people, primarily your end users. This means frequently interacting with your end users through a variety of means, like walkabouts, hoteling, and user meetings. Your super users are your best resource. Please download the LiveWorks app and complete the survey to provide feedback on this session. For questions and comments, please reach out to me at dmartin at creowindchill.com. You can find my Creo Parametric YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash creoparametric. There is a handout available for this session available on my Dropbox at my website www.creowindchill.com. Thank you and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.